Alright, what's up guys, and welcome to the first educational video that I actually have on my YouTube. All my other videos are just like trolling and shit. Um, and basically in this video, what I want to do is go over the three types of natural steroids that humans produce. And go over um, the chemistry of each one, um, some derivative examples, basically what each, each of those do, um, what changes in the structure to produce a derivative does in your body and you know that, that kind of stuff. There's going to be a lot of chemistry in this. For those of you that don't know uh, my background, I have a Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry from UCLA, so that's going to come in handy in this video. But I'll try to um, allow you guys to be able to follow along with me as best I can. And I apologize in advance for any awkward pauses or fucking up in words that I say during this video because there's going to be a lot of information that I want to cover here within like 10 minutes of this video. So I'll get started right now. And basically, I'm going to start with referring you guys to this structure. This is the sterile nucleus. It's just um, um, the backbone of any kind of anabolic steroid, or steroids in general. And you have this numbering system here that, um, sorry, we're going to be referring to whenever just dis discussing different alterations to structures and just discussing um, wherever certain functional groups are. So I'll be going back to this to help you guys follow along with that. And basically, so the three natural types of steroids that we have in our body are testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, and mandrolone. And let me just point out um, a point regarding androgenic and anabolic potency. Um, just the standard of how they actually like measure that for you, those of you who don't know. Um, to measure androgenic potency, what they do is they measure the percent growth of the seminal vesicles and um, ventral prostate. And they take the average of um, both of those because um, both of those don't really grow like to a, in a one-to-one -one ratio of, another, of each other. And then for anabolic potency, they measure the levitor ani, which is a sex organ, not a skeletal muscle. So there is some androgen receptors in there, um, but that's just the standard. And um, for the anabolic index, if the number is greater than one, it's more anabolic. If the number is less than one, it's uh, more androgenic. So I just want to point that out. Maybe you'll find it interesting, maybe you won't, whatever. There it is. Um, and to get started, I just, I'll start with testosterone. Now what we note here, and with most of these, is you have a keto group at the third carbon position, which is this double bond oh, right here. You have a double bond at the fourth and fifth carbon right here. You have a hydroxyl group at the 17th carbon right here. And basically, um, what I want to say is two points. One for here, one for here. I'll start with here. Um, the point, if this hydrox this hydroxyl group is reduced to a keto group, or sorry, oxidized to a keto group. The steroid is um, rendered inactive, and if this keto group right here is reduced to an alcohol, um, the steroid is also inactive. That um, you'll see many metabolites of dihydrotestosterone um, will be reduced by the. 3-alpha-hydroxysteroid uh, dehydrogenase enzyme to um, an inactive metabolite just because this will turn into a hydroxyl group. Um, okay, enough of that. And then, so, testosterone, back to testosterone. Um, what we commonly see in testosterone is the conversion to estrogen via the aromatase enzyme. What the aromatase enzyme does is it um, aromatizes this ring right here. It'll add, it basically, this ring becomes two more double bonds. It becomes aromatic, which is, if you see in the structure of estrogen, which, or sorry, estradiol, which I didn't draw up here, um, you'll note that in the structure. So that's what, where the term aromatization comes from. Um, and then another thing in testosterone, you'll see is the, f the reduction of this C4-5 double bond by 5-alpha reductase, that's another enzyme, to DHT. Basically it just removes this double bond here to this same structure right here. 
Um, I'll go over DHT in a minute. But what I want to do now is go into one of the testosterone derivatives, boldenone. Um, basically the only change between these two you'll see is the additional double bond right here. Now what that does for this steroid is it um, reduces the, aroma, the aromatization to estradiol by about half there and it also makes boldenone a poor substrate um, for the 5-alpha reductase enzyme to convert into um, dihydroboldenone in this case, not dihydrotestosterone because it's boldenone, not testosterone. Um, so, let's say um, uh, tissues that have high amounts of 5-alpha reductase such as the liver, the scalp, um, the prostate, there'll be less, um, you'll have those less androgenic effects with boldenone compared to testosterone because it's not going to be as much conversion to DHT, which has a higher affinity for the androgen receptor than um, either of these, actually. Let me see. I believe that's all I want to say about boldenone. Just a quick fact. Um, if the only difference between boldenone and dianabol is dianabol has a methyl group right here. It's an, or, um, an oral an oral steroid. That's the only difference. Um, but you see that just adding that methyl group right there completely changes the the kind of effects you get from this steroid. Um, let me see my notes for a second. I believe that's all I want to say about these testosterone and testosterone derivatives for now. Uh, yeah. So now we'll go over to DHT. Um, what you notice about DHT, like I said before, it has a stronger affinity to the androgen receptor than testosterone. It's about four times stronger, I believe. But um, the thing to note is that DHT is more susceptible to reduction by the 3 alpha hydroxy dehydrogenase enzyme. Right here, this, this keto group will turn to an alcohol because it lacks this double bond right here. So just because DHT is more, um, binds more androgenically, binds more strongly to the androgen receptor, doesn't necessarily mean it gets to the androgen receptor in time before the 3-alpha hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase enzyme um, gets to it and then renders this steroid inactive. It's, it turns into an inactive metabolite. Um, in the case of DHT, it turns into androstenediol, which is, um, this has an alcohol right here, and this is the same. Um, so what they do for DHT derivatives, the whole point of them basically is to prevent this keto group to being reduced to an alcohol. Like for example here we have oxandrolone, which is otherwise known as anivar. Um, basically, this is the only steroid that has the has a direct chemical alteration to the actual steroid backbone, which is this 2-oxo group right here. The second carbon has been replaced by an oxygen, and basically what that does is it um, prevents uh, this 3-keto group to being reduced by that 3-alpha uh, hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase enzyme. And it's, so it stabilizes the three keto group, um, so the steroid is not rendered inactive. And then another point you'll see is because this is an oral steroid, it has methylation right here instead of um, a typical hydrogen. So whenever this passes through the liver, it is this um, this hydroxyl group is not converted to a double bonded O, which is a keto group. Um, since there is this methyl group there to protect it. If this was converted to a keto group, this whole molecule would be rendered inactive. Just um, So I believe that's all I want to say about the DHTs. Also, we've covered why DHT is a poor anabolic because it doesn't necessarily get the chance to bind to the androgen receptor before being um, Reduced by the 3 alpha dehydroxy steroid. I'm sorry, 3 alpha hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase. It's a long name. And do, 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 do. we covered why DHC derivatives have functional groups, what their purposes is, 
emphasis R. And basically, so lack of that double bond there makes this group more susceptible to being converted to an alcohol. Okay. And then lastly, we have the nandrolone compounds. Um, the, the only difference between testosterone and nandrolone is that nandrolone, nandrolone is missing the 19th carbon, that methyl group right here, which also you'll commonly hear the name 19 nor. That's kind of where that name originated from. Um, so the thing with nandrolone, it has a slower conversion to estrogen, estrogen than uh, testosterone. And um, let me look here. Okay, it's it's um, basically the least androgenic steroid that you can find because um, whenever it gets reduced by the 5 alpha reductase, it reduces to dihydronandrolone, which is very, very mild, andro a very mild androgenic. So that's um, basically a very good take home point about nandrolone. Okay, metabolize. So, in target tissues such as the prostate, scalp, and liver, you don't have those DHT related effects, I mean, those androgenic related effects with nandrolone. Um, compared to, say, testosterone, whenever it uh, gets reduced to dihydrotestosterone, it becomes more androgenic in those tissues. Which, um, removing this one, and this, removing the fourth and fifth carbon double bond here makes it actually a poorer substrate to bind to the androgen, androgen receptor compared to testosterone's derivative DHT. Okay, and then um, nandrolone is kind of the only one that you have to re worry about those progesterone uh, related effects, the only uh, class of compounds where you worry about that. I don't want to get into progesterone in this video. I would probably have to do a whole other video just for that topic because um, uh, progesterone production from these, it's more complicated than just simply an aromatization from testosterone to estradiol. Um, let me know if you guys want a video on that, I'll look at it. But here we have um, a common derivative of nandrolone, which is trembolone, everybody's favorite. And what we notice here that's different is we have this uh, two more double bonds here, the ninth and tenth double bond here, and the eleventh and twelfth double bond here. Now remember our original structure, refer to these numbers that I'm talking about here. And basically what the ninth and 10th double bond does is it inhibits that aromatization um, to estrogen. Like we said with nandrolone, you still get some conversion to estrogen, but it's going to be um, significantly less than testosterone. So with trembolone, you get no aromatization because of that additional double bond. And then the 11th and 12th carbon-carbon double bond right here increases the binding affinity of trembolone to the androgen receptor. And another thing about trembolone is you have no uh, reduction by the 5-alpha reductase enzyme into, um, um, it would be dihydrotrembolone, but that doesn't exist. Um, so this cannot be reduced. Um, so that makes trem trembolone quite androgenic in that um, case. You have no aromatization with trembolone, no reduction by trembolone, and obviously um, no 3-keto reduction because of this double bond. I think that's all I want to say about these also for now. Yeah. Um, okay, so I mean, basically that's all I'm going to say in this video, guys. Um, I hope you guys like this video. I'm sure it's like over 10 minutes by now, but like if you guys want any other kind of topics that you want me to cover, like just really get into the science and chemistry of these things, you can either let me know, those of you who know me on Facebook, you know, message me, whatever, 
comment on the video if you like the video obviously like it subscribe to my channel all that shit um so yeah hope you guys enjoy and um are you not pissing?